Uh, the first presenter is uh, Manuel Jimenez. Uh, he's uh, it's a student up here at Purdue, and uh, he's going to be talking about uh, um, markups in maritime shipping. So over to you, Manuel. So are you guys able to see my presentation? Yes, we can see. Okay, so thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Manuel Jimenez. I'm a PhD student here at Purdue, and today I will, I will present a paper that I have titled Trade Costs and Markups in Maritime Shipping. The main motivation to develop this paper is that maritime shipping is the most important mode of transportation for international trade. We're talking that about 70 to 80 percent of the value traded worldwide is moved by sea. And as probably you know, there are several reasons that explain this result. For instance, the container revolution that took place mostly in the developed countries during the second half of last century, as well as the adoption of the hub and spoke model for shipping the cargo by carriers in the same period, because both like um, things reduce the time for shipping the cargo, also reduce the cost for carriers, and the most important thing reduce the cost the freight charges for shipping the cargo by sea. What is the problem? The point is that international trade became highly dependent on an industry in which it widely believed that carriers exert market power. Why? Well, the literature mainly claimed two reasons. On the one hand, the literature claimed that there is an excessive shipping capacity supplied by very large companies that aiming to reduce costs. They have been trying to put a lot of bases on the sea to reduce their cost, exploring economies to scale. Along with these, these carriers, these huge companies, they have developed this very complex network of hubs in order to reach very far remote places, of course, reducing, of course, the cost, exploring, in this case, economies to scope. What is the point of this? The point of this is that these two things are leading a concentration in the market in these few fewer companies, because for a new company to enter to this market is very complicated. They will need to invest a lot in a fleet of bases in a very complex network. So the entry of firms is not very dynamic to this market. So this market tends to be very concentrated in few companies. On the other hand, the literature also claimed that this market is, uh, is a market in which carriers exert market power because there exists a lack of antitrust policy regulations that allow carriers to make price fees agreements. And of course, the question is, well, but if that occurs, what do, how do these market conditions affect transportation cost for trade? And the answer is, well, we don't know yet. What we know so far is that previous studies have shown that carriers do exert market power and that that market power is somehow related to trade in the sense that Carriers are able or exert more market power depending on the distance of the shipment, the price of the product, the level of suitability of the product, and even the number of carriers in a route. However, what is what these previous studies have been able to do, that is the paper of Fink in 2002 and Hummels in 2009, in which the frontier is at these days, is that they have been able to quantify the magnitude of this problem. So, in other words, what the literature still lacks are, are absolute measures of the maritime shipping markups that allow us to make a decomposition of the freight charges between the costs and the markups that allow us to make a comparison with other trade costs in order to magnify the size of the distortion to the trade. Also, to allow us to quantify the effects of trade for on trade flows and economic welfare, and also to that allow us to make an evaluation whether these markups affect in the same way or in a different way the developing countries or the countries that are geographically distant from the destination markets. In that order of ideas, the main question that I answer in this paper is how much higher are the freight rates that they will be without a non-competitive pricing behavior? In other words, how much are the freight markups? To the extent I answer this question, I also provide answer to these secondary questions. What is the effect of the markup for trade? What is the welfare cost of the markups? How large are the markups relative to tariff? As I said, this is critical, for example, when we're dealing with JITA, because we usually test the chalk of a tariff. But if we are able to quantify the tariff equivalent to a markup, we can also make that simulation. Of course, 
It is also important to know how this affects developing countries, for instance, so why tested here, and also whether these markups are larger in longer runs. For this presentation, I will provide estimates for the first three secondary questions. I don't think that I will have time for the second two. I apologize for that, but I can take a questions at the end if that is the case. What is the main stylized fact behind this paper? U.S. imports data allows very easily to see that the CIF price of a product, as expected, as totally normal, um, is different depending on the place to which the product was delivered. For instance, here in the screen, in panel, and of course that difference is because of the freight charges. For instance, here in panel A, you have the ad valorem charges that of course are explaining that uh, differences of cell phone, television, bicycles, and car tires. All these charges that were charged for importing these products from China in 2017 and placed them in Seattle, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. So as we were expecting, the free charges differ and are different, and the question is why? Why this is interesting? Well, because if you see carefully the table panel A, you can very easily see that most of these free charges are lower to Seattle rather than to Los Angeles and San Francisco. And the question is why? And one possible answer is, well, Seattle is closer to China, so carriers might be incurring in lower costs, and that might imply that they are able to charge a lower freight charge. But of course, there might be, of course, another possible answer if we see panel B, in which we have the number of transactions, the volume imported, and the value, volume and value imported, in which we can see that Los Angeles and San Francisco are larger Port. So what we can see here that can allow us to provide a second answer to that question is that, well, even when these two places are a bit um, farther from China, carriers are able, presumably, to exert higher economies to escape when shipping products to this, um, to Port Los Angeles and San Francisco. That implies that they can exploit higher economies to scale. Maybe that the cost, even for shipping these products to these products to these places, are the same or even lower in comparison to Seattle, and what might be driving these higher markups is that given the higher demand that Los Angeles and San Francisco face, carriers are able to charge higher markups. So in few words, what I what we can see here is that these differences might be explained either differences in cost or either by differences in markups, and that is totally uncertain and unclear in the literature. So in order to disentangle this, what I do in this paper is that I model how carriers uh, model the behavior of how carriers set their optimal shipping freight rates. To do that, what I do is that I adapt the structural model that Atkin and Donaldson developed for intermediaries, and I adapt that model for the maritime shipping sector, making three standard assumptions in, in the maritime shipping industry, claiming that this, the carriers are rational agents such that they maximize their profits. Second, that carriers observe the shipping demand and that the shipping demand is totally indexed to the import demand. And third, that carriers aim to extract as possible the rents of the market. So given that like very broad introduction, the problem that they solve is very simple. What we said is that each carrier denoted here by L maximize their profit function with respect to the amount, the amount that they are shipping that is little q of product K in a route R. I will be using R for the combination OD through the entire paper and presentation, so I don't want that you guys get confused. R is equal to OD, origin destination, and the idea here is that each carrier L maximize the profit with respect to all the achievement through all routes, all products K. In parentheses here, you have the margin per unit in which F is the freight rate, R the route product. Here we have that that like inverse the money, we want to call it that way, depending on the entire demand, capital Q of product K through route R. This capital delta, R preferences conditions, uh, underlying that inverse demand, less the set of costs, or this is the margin per unit, times the unit that they are shipping, less a set of fixed cost. Given the fact that I'm assuming that they are rational agents, the first or the condition show us that the optimal for a rate that this guy should charge will depend on the level of cost and to the product of three terms that are somehow related to markups. I mean, the first term 
is not the demand elasticity, but it's somehow. The second is a standard conduct parameter, and the third is the actual amount that they are shipping. So, something that is very important to note here is that even when all, the, all these terms are related to markups, something in which the literature have reached an agreement in recent years is that markups are variable and endogenous to cost. So, in few words, what I'm saying is that even when I have all these terms related to markups, I know that these markups are totally endogenous to this cost. So this expression do not allow me to do a good estimation of the markups per se, because I will need first to identify what is the portion that is coming only um, when I, that are coming only from cost and the part that are coming only from markups. So I have a theoretical challenge to know how to separate both things. And to do this, what I do in this paper is that I apply the theoretical identification of Atkinson Donaldson that said, okay, in an intermediary market, it should be true that the price gap, the price in the destination, like the minus the price in the origin, that in my uh, framework, is the CIF less FOB or the freight charge should always match the cost for that intermediary, I mean the cost in this case, for the carriers, plus those markups, plus the markups that they charge that are a function of the cost, as I said, because are endogenous. Of course, that are a function of the competition condition that I have denoted here with fee in, a, in that route shipping a, pro a product K and the preferences conditions. And the identification strategy, the strategy is very simple. What they said is that if we evaluate how this is how this identity is perturbed or affected when a um, cost shifter comes up, we can see that this identity can be, or the effect can be broken in two parts. In a direct effect, that is how change the actual cost due to that cost uh, shifter that is a direct effect, plus an indirect effect that is taking all the changes in the markups due to changes in the competition condition or in the preferences due to that cost shift. What is critical here is that in the data, I'm able to observe the left-hand side part. I can observe somehow the direct effect because it's how the, co the actual costs are changing. But of course, I'm not I'm going to be able to see completely this effect if I'm able to retrieve this row that is the churn room pass rate. In other words, is how much is being transmitted from the cost to the freight rate. So the idea here then is that if I observe the left hand side, I observe this change in the cost and I am able to estimate this row, where range in terms, I'm going to be able to uh, identify the markups because I'm going to be able to solve for this last indirect effect that is capturing all the variation in the markups. If that is not clear, in a standard textbook graph, the identification strategy is very simple. If this is a very standard textbook graph for an uncompetitive price behavior, and there is a cost shifter, there is a change in cost, that change in cost will map the change in prices via changes in the marginal revenues. And if we have a learning index in mind for, for a markup that is a priceless cost divided by the prices, we can be easily see the identification of the markups. The critical part here is that this transmission of cost to the price is not always one-to-one, -one, and this pass through rate, this row uh, is a parameter that I showed you guys before, allow us to capture that, because if this is linear, the transmission might be one-to-one, -one, but if the demand is convex, for instance, might be more than complete, or if the demand is convex, might be um, just a partial pass through rate of the changes in that cost shifter to the final price, and of course, to the markups. And then, what we only need to do is just to use a parsimonious demand system that allow me to consider the different like shapes or forms that can take that demand. In this case, consistent with the original uh, methodology, I use the below and fader demand system that allow me to take all these different shapes and to calculate in a very like robust way this pass rate that is like the critical piece to do a complete identification of the amount of cheap markets. If I, if I do that, the federal condition that I show you that is here in this first line, I can rewrite that as this expression that is, I think that is number three, I'm not able to see completely here in my computer, in which I can divide completely in a theoretical way what portion is coming from margins, marginal cost, and what portion are coming from marginal, no marginal, so from markup. And of course, the idea here is that if I apply a learning index, I will be done. I will be able to estimate the markups, solving for that like theoretical challenge of endogeneity of the markups to the marginal cost. 
But I, what information I use in this paper? I use imports data, US imports data, each observation. This is a standard data. I mean, I have each observation combines information per product, country of origin, US customs, district of arrival, year, FOB value, shipping weight, shipping charges. I estimate these markups for the period before the crisis and after the crisis. Given some interest to know what occurred during the crisis, I also estimate the, that during the crisis. But of course, I'm aware that a one strong assumption that I do in my estimates is parameter stability. And given the noise during the crisis, that might be questioned in this period. Uh, I also estimate all this, only the market for the differentiated products that I have like classified using the rush classification. And I use a standard other sources like, for instance, SEPI database, BASI, BLS, IMF, et cetera, et cetera. Having that in mind, the estimation strategy is going to be, let me go back to this. Oh my gosh. I had some technical issues. Let me go back here to the data. The estimation strategy is simple. I will have my first order condition that I show you rearranged somehow. I will need to estimate row. So I estimate that row into a stage process. In the first stage, I decompose this trade in terms of the FOB and the CIF price. What allows me to see very easily that I can retrieve the pass through rate even either using the variation of the cost function or the FOB price. Using the variation of the code will be like the more like a straight way to do it. The point is that I do not know exactly the technology used for a car for a particular product. So as plan B, I can exploit the variation in the FOB price because the coefficient is the same. So that's exactly what I do in this paper. I estimate the pass-through rate using the FOB price, the variation of the FOB price. Uh, and once I know that, uh, like pass rate that is going to allow me to know exactly what is the transmission of the cost to the final prices. I will estimate this expression of the freight charges, trying to rearrange the pass rate that I have here and writing that expression here as the final expression here, in which at the end what I have is an standard expression for the ad valor and freight rates. If we're equal to one, this is going to be the ad valor and freight rates in terms of the cost and in terms of some some product and ratio of some terms that are capturing the part that is coming from the pass through for the markups, in which A, just to be clear here, is the maximum of willingness to pay for shipping a product. Sorry for being a bit fast, but I don't think that I have uh, much time to go. Having this in mind, the idea is that if I am able to estimate rho, estimating this, I have the cost. I can retrieve the markups very easily. This is my original expression, so I can apply a learning index to here, subtracting costs and dividing by the freight. And this is the final expression that I use for my markups. Here, it's important that you guys be aware of something. Given the fact that I follow a two-stage process for, for an, in, in the estimation strategy, I estimate the pass rates, the adjusted free rate, that is the expression that I just showed you, in which I have like an balance expression for the carrier uh, for the carrier as a function of the cost and the markups, and of course the shipping markups. So given the time that I have, I will only focus in the markups. In the markups, I estimate the markups for the US East Coast and the US West Coast. Something important here is that given the fact that I'm exploring the FOB variation to retrieve the past rate, for sure that FOB price might be totally endogenous to the freight charges. So what I do, this, what I do in this paper, Consistently with the original methodology, I initially estimate that with OLS, assuming full exogeneity, and a strong assumption saying that the FOB are not a function of these pay rates. But of course, that is super strong to claim. So I also estimate with a two-stage least square and, and also with a Gaussian copula method that is a assuming free technique. Uh, to be honest, I know that my OLS estimate for sure might be having some endogeneity issues and the two-stage Lewis square my instrument are not very strong, are weak. So the endogeneity problem might be even worse. The Gaussian copula estimate that is a very good estimator similar to the free instrument free technique as since 94. Uh, I consider it provide me the best estimates here are grounded in statistical terms better 
So I will only pay attention for that because I think that those are the two estimates that are in the fair row in both columns. So going in detail to the results, what we can see very clear is that the, the East Coast, that is the one that in the US mainly allows to the shipping for products from Europe, used to charge prior to the crisis a markup of about 43%, and the West Coast, that is mainly trade with area, China and Asia, was 34%. Due to the crisis, that gap that was about 9 percentage points decreased to a ratio that is almost 2 percentage points. The markups are converging to a third part of the freight charge. So having in mind that the freight charge for shipping a product to the US prior to case it used to be 6% and after about 4 and having in mind that the markup represents about a third, what we can see is that the markups are equivalent to a tariff or 1.4%. That is close um, to the average simple, the average tariff in the US that is about 2%. I'm close to finish. If I have that in mind, that tariff equivalent, a tariff, and using the trade as easy that we have usually in the literature, that is three or five, a back to envelope uh, estimate shows that the imports of differential products should be four or 11 points higher. Also using that estimate and applying our Kaloki's uh, framework, allow us to estimate that the welfare costs are about 0.1 or 0.2%. And with this, I close. Markups represent a third of the valuated freight charges uh, that are equivalent to a tariff for 1.4 to 2.6. US imports differential products should be 4 or 12% higher in a world without markups, and the welfare costs of these markups are 0.2%. With this, I finish, and I'm sorry for this extra minute that I took. So, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Manuel. Um, very interesting. Um, I, the, I, we have some time for questions. Uh, so if there are questions, um, feel free. Oh, hi, Manuel. Uh, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. I just wonder, during your observation, is there any significant change in the term of uh, trade policy between the U.S. and China? For example, when it's a trade war between U.S. and China, they change the tariff for import for several products, something like that? Uh, that is a very <laughs> good question. I did not consider a partic that particular case of the trade war because if I'm not wrong, that trade war is out of the period in which I'm analyzing this. I mean, if I'm not wrong, the trade war was in recent years, and yeah. my sample go until 2017. But of course, having the tariff equivalent of the markups, we can test, uh, the, like the, we can chop, for example, the GTA framework saying, okay, if the markups are 1.4%, um, uh, we can try to come up with a model, or we can try to come up with some exercise in which we can use the digital framework, make a chart, and see how the trade flows change. That would be my thought right now. But I mean, to be honest, that was out of my sample, so I didn't consider that. Mm. And uh, I think I have one more question. It's about. Uh, whether you consider about the exchange rate, because there's some claim that China tend to make the, um, you know, the currency become cheaper to export. So, whether you consider the exchange rate also in your. Uh, so, you're using whether if I consider the. Over all the devaluation of the yuan as a driver of the export of from China. That is exactly yeah. Yeah. Well, I did not consider that because what I'm doing is just that not only the analysis from the US perspective, I'm using US import data, and China entered to this uh, role as an origin source. 
of course that like you want um, the evaluation is exactly what I was explaining the endogeneity of the FOB price because the FOB price might be endogenous to that condition and I'm correcting that with this like method that I'm trying to correct for that endogeneity my FOB price because that would be the only part in which I think that the evaluation of the exchange rate might be affected. Okay, great, thanks. No worries. Okay, I think uh, I, I might ask a question. Uh, just, you know, there were some results you didn't get to. Uh, do you have something you want to tell us about uh, developing countries and remote countries, about you know, our, how our markups different in those cases? Uh, I don't think that I will have some time to show all the, the estimates, but um, the main result that I got is very interesting. Those, the maritime mark shipping markups tend to be lower when you are shipping to developed countries. I mean, it seems to be that when you are shipping to Western Europe, of course, there are more competition. Carriers are not able to charge higher markups, such that carriers you mean of carriers or from? Excuse me. You mean to or from? You mean from? Right? From, from, yes. When yeah, you are from, from, from yes, yes. Yeah. So that implies that carriers tend to exert more market power when they are importing with their shipping products from developing countries. And also when we evaluate that, depending on the geographical distance, we observe that carriers, of course, as previous uh, literature found, that they exert more market power when they are shipping products from more distant um, places. OK. Okay, that, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, thank you so much. Are there other questions for Manuel? Okay, um, I don't know, you're to, should we move ahead or do we wait uh, if we're a little bit ahead of time? Um, so yeah, I mean, from the past experience that I had, uh, people, especially the, the, the people can go ahead in terms of uh, presenting. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I, I know when we meet in person, sometimes we wait so people can. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I think it's probably a good idea just to go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see. The next speaker is uh, Claudio De Silva. Um, and he will be speaking about um, uh, dam rupture in Minas Gerais in Brazil and the effects on productivity and regional development. Um, so I think if you could share your screen, Claudio, uh, we can we can uh, uh, get started with your presentation. You're muted still. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Claudio. Uh, I'm from the Federal University of Rio de Fora in Minas Gerais, Brazil. And I'm going to uh, introduce to you this paper, name it the Brumadinho Dam Rupture Disaster in Minas Gerais, Brazil, and the Productivity Regional Economy Impacts Using a Computable General Equilibrium Approach. So the, I, I have done this work with Victor, Ryan, Thais, and Fernando, both from Brazil too. Let's see. So, uh, so I divided this presentation between the introduction and the goals, modeling framework, results, and conclusions. The introduction. So uh, according to the uh, Brazilian Institute of Geography and the Statistics, the extractive industry is an important sector uh, in the Brazilian economy which represents 2.5% uh, of national GDP and a quarter of that production 
grids located in Minas Gerais. And this extractive sector mine have some uh, features, like uh, it is uh, capital intensive and depends on natural resource. And uh, it produces a primary product aimed at exportation. It's an important product uh, aimed to uh, uh, for our trade balance. There are some uh, negative external externalities, uh, as contamination of water resources, geologic impact, landscape degradation, air pollution, according to the literature. And a specific, there are there is a, a specific uh, feature here in Minas Gerais, like in the use of tiles dam to in the production. The object of that, according to the literature, is to avoid um, environmental problems. However, uh, in the in the last years, happens the rupture that Tallinn's dumps, like as it happens in Brumadinho, uh, 2019. On January 25th, 2019, occurred in Brumadinho the worst, uh, it's considered the worst the environmental disaster in Brazil that uh, occurred the disruption of the times done at Corrigo do Feijão Mine under the responsibility of Vale SA Mine Company. That uh, hit some, uh, some things like plant facilities, many place workshops and administration meetings, as well as the road access were blocked. It is estimated, according to the literature, that at least 18 municipalities have been affected along the Paropeba River Basin, resulting nowadays 1.1 uh, million people exposed directly and indirectly. The halt of activities reduce it extractive production around 8 million tons in that time. And unfortunately, 270 people have died and another level are still missing. In addition to local and regional loss, like material, cultural, economy, environmental, and health. So uh, the papers, that uh, write about these disasters uh, says normally that this environmental disaster tends to uh, tends to the soil contamination and water contamination, and that affect uh, consequently the the agriculture and the health and uh, the people health, and of course affect the sectors in the economy and tends to affect the labor productivity in the cities uh, affected by the disasters. And this is translated in an economic impact. So the object of this study, the main object, is to estimate the interregional economic impact of a reduction in labor productivity in the, in the municipalities affected by the Brumadinho disaster. The idea, the hypothesis here is uh, the pollution comes from these disasters of the rupture of the, the Tallinn's dam, uh, affects the economy through negative externalities, like the water contamination and the soil contamination, and then the affect the labor productivity, translated uh, result, resulting in an economic impact. Specifically, we aim at estimated the input of food table by disaggregating the affected regions in Minas Gerais, because we don't have input output tables for the cities. What we have done in this paper is uh, to estimate uh, in, 
and uh, regional input of two tables, disaggregating the series effect in these disasters. Analyze the economy structure of the affected regions uh, with uh, some uh, input output techniques. And, and the imports of the strike sector. And finally, calculating the regional impacts as a function of sector change in labor productivity. We use the BMaria. BMaria is a CG model developed by Haddad and that uh, adapted for this case of Minas Gerais. Uh, we use the, this model, the, the Brazilian multi-sector regional and inter-regional analysis model, based on Orani structure, and this, in the, we use the stacked version, taking the estimation from the input of two tables from Brumadinho, for Brumadinho and the series effect. We estimated that input output tables with the inter-regional input output adjustment system, me, uh, method uh, detail in Haddad et al. Uh, 2017. And you use for that uh, regional data from uh, the Minister of Economy and Brazilian Ministry of Economy and uh, the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics. And more than this data, we use the Google Maps for calculating the distance metrics. All those, all those data, uh, base data were used to estimate the input output tables for Brumadinho and the cities uh, has a, uh, the cities have affected by the disaster, have been affected by the disaster. So it disaggregated this input output tables in, into 22 sectors and five regions, like Belo Horizonte, the capital of Minas Gerais, Brumadinho, the city that happens, that happened the disaster, and the other cities affected by the eruption of the Times Dam, the rest of Minas Gerais state, and the rest of Brazil. So here in this map, we can see uh, the cities affected by the disaster, occurring in Brumadinho, just um, uh, here, we have the capital, the capital, Belo Horizonte, the city of Brumadinho, it is in the metropolitan region, and here we have the other cities affected for the Brumadinho disaster along the Paropeba River, because the, the, the dump, uh, fall in the river. And here, the other cities in the region, the state of Minas Gerais and the, Brazil, the rest of the country. Uh, so we divide in five regions here, you know, like Belo Horizonte, Brumadinho, other cities affect, rest of Minas Gerais and the rest of Brazil. Here, just to see that Brumadinho is a small city corresponded just a 0.03% from the G national GDP. And there are, there are just uh, 30, uh, 37,000 people. And the rest of the cities affect, there are uh, eight, uh, 800, 75,000 people in that city. This is data from 2015. What we have done with this data, it's calibrated the BMaria, adapted with this data, and uh, calculated the impact of a change in labor productivity for to to you for to the shock of the, in the in a decrease of labor productivity, we use the estimate have done have made by Veloso et al. He calculated the growth of the growth of uh, labor productivity in Brazil in the Brazilian economy 
between the sectors, the sector in the Brazilian economy, for the period of 2002-2013. And this, this average, we use like a, a reducer parameter for labor productivity. Is the last data that we have for the sectors in the Brazilian economy that we have found. So we have made this shock in, uh, in the parameter uh, percentile change of A1 label, label because our model allows to uh, disaggregate the labor between occupations like formal, informal, and other options. However, it's not our interesting, not our objective. So in our model, you just have labor a vector of labor. And so we have the, made the both A1 lab and A1 label. However, the, the result didn't change. And see if you put, see if you do the shock in A1 lab, you need to correct a zero in the matrix because there are, there is a, in a sector in Brumadinho that is zero, like electricity. So we need to put a, a a number uh, not uh, very, very, very close to zero, but not zero to avoid the singular matrix. We have have made the both and the result didn't change. We use a short run closer, like capital fixed in the short run. And here there are the the values of a change in labor productive estimated by Veloso, just to the size of the shock. And this shock has been implemented in regional two and three that, that were the cities affected by the disaster. And the results, we divide the result between two parts. The first part is to understand the structure of uh, economy structure of the cities to uh, to see what the the key sectors and what is the importance of the extractive industry in the Minas Gerais economy and Brazil economy and we can use for that some techniques from put out put like the linkage and the extract extraction method we can see here like in Brumadinho city, we will note that Brumadinho, the mine or the structured sector is an is a important sector, but not a key sector because the, the, uh, this, this activity didn't, uh, uh, doesn't depend on inter, intersector offer and Intersect demand is not a key sector, but is an important sector we will see in the extraction map. Because the sector aimed to exportation and at exportation. And the other series effect, we can see that mining is a sector that's depend, dependent on inter, intersector offer. And the result of extract, uh, extractive uh, industry, the importance of extractive industry in Minas Gerais and Brazil, we can see in Brumadinho what happens. So if you uh, take off uh, the extractive sector in the in Brumadinho economy, the the GDP decrease, uh, the output decrease almost uh, thirty six percent, and Brazil. 3,2% uh, and Minas Gerais 6,2% decrease. We what we have done here is just to put zero in the extractive sector in the uh, the um, matrix coefficient, uh, the technical coefficient matrix. We put zero there and population what happens in the economy without the sectors. And finally, the economy, when you decrease the labor productive in Brumadinho and the rest of municipalities affect, 
the GDP decrease in Brumadinho 0,2% and the rest of municipalities affect 0, uh, 0,4, almost 0,5% in the rest of the cities most uh, the the result of this rest of the cities is worse than Bromagin. The active level change, uh, mo the most change is the industry link, uh, industries, industries from public utility, constru uh, construct uh, financial activities, commerce, Farming, electricity is the most uh, decreasing values in this in this uh, sectors, and we can see here the extractive industry. Uh, the result is not worse than the others. We can see here uh, would be because this sector is a capital intensive not labor intensive. So the result uh, decrease a, a little, but not, not uh, like the others. And the result in the export is interesting because the decrease in the export, it, it, it is in the most important sector in our trade balance, like farming, extractive industry, and manufacture food. That is the most, the stretch of industry is the one and the most important products export from Brazil, for Brazil. So the dam rupture of Brumadinho, Minas Gerais affect directly 18 munici municipalities in Minas Gerais state. It generates sever severe socioeconomic and environment effects. Simulation using Be Maria Bruma adapted from, for Brumadin show that the aggregated results are small. However, the sectoral analysis demonstrates that the difference in the output of the sector are more significant, as well as the impacts on exports from the extracting sector. It is an important component of the Brazilian trade balance. The estimate and the calibration of this model are useful for future study, study investigating the impacts of this disaster on the region. In addition to assisting the planning of public policies to minimize the negative result of this tragedy. It is relevant for the analysis to incorporate capital productivity in the next simulations, considering that sector most affected by the dis disruption are capital intensive. So we are working on this paper yet, and this is the primary result that we want to show to you. So thank you so much. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, so we're going to have some questions now. Uh, if you just indicate uh, that you have a question, or we can have that question. Can I ask you something? Uh, you guys are trying to measure the impact of this, like, budget to the labor productivity. And if that productivity is decreasing, uh, that would imply some reallocation of the labor. Have you guys come to model what is occurring with the uh, with the labor, or is it because only changes in the GDP? I mean, I was wondering whether the labor productivity is output out of labor, so that would imply some changes in the GDP, some changes in the in the labor, and I was wondering whether you guys have been able to track whether that has been changing from one sector to another. I mean, so only for curiosity. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a good question. Thank you. Uh, this is our challenge to work with labor productivity. Not was easy because we don't have data for for that. What we have just first is to use uh, um, earns earns to try to make sure what happened in the after the disaster 
in the sectors and economic sectors in that city. However, it's not a good, not, it's not fit good. And we found a, a paper that estimated the average of productive in Brazil in the sector, between the sector. He has done uh, all the sect, all the mainly sector in the economy, like farming, extractive industry, manufacturing. What is the average in Brazilian average a gro growth rate from labor productivity? Here. And we use that as a parameter to simu simulate what happens if decrease uh, the cities didn't achieve that uh, that rating after the disaster. Like we have used like a parameter from this paper to use the average of national uh, of national like to see what the happen this disaster affected the labor productive. So I we imagine like the cities didn't achieve that uh, that uh, growth in the productivity what happened in the GDP, in the active level, in, in mainly in the exports and the export of these sectors, main important sectors that exports. Because ha as you can see, the uh, extractive sectors is important, is important from Brahmagin economy and the regional economy. So see if you lo lost uh, the product, labor product, what happened that export, just we use the, this paper as a parameter from Veloso. Veloso. But it's a new, a new challenge, like in the other, in the future simulation, like to estimate the labor productivity. We estimate that what happened before the disaster, after the disaster, what happened labor productivity. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, hi, Claudia. Uh, can I have a question? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. If I get your results right, uh, the GDP shrink and the sectoral output reduce. Uh, I just wonder why the employment in the uh, district increases. Increase? Yeah, in the in employment, because when the output reduce, then the SOP uh, fall in demand for capital and labor, and there should be some unemployment. But your result indicates that there's an uh, increase in the employment. I just wonder what the type of uh, function that you use between capital and labor, whether you use the yes or... Uh, uh, because I, uh, that uh, we use a, sh a short run, uh, closer, yeah. so the yeah. capital is fixed. The yeah. uh, capital is fixed. So when you, when decrease the product in the, the equation, we need more uh, labor to do the same uh, output. So the output also reduce, right? Can I? Uh, I couldn't understand. Uh, your your output, the GDP, also reduce. It means that the economy will demand less capital and labor. Uh, let me see if I understand. Uh, yeah, the, what the result? The you said that our GDP decrease, right? Yeah. Yes, because because. Uh, you uh, you put you increase the uh, the quantity quantity of the labor that you need to produce the same right and the, evidently the price of uh, this this primary factor increase and the the prices and the economy increase because that the cost of production increase, the price increase, and the demand decrease, and that results in a reduction in the GDP. Yeah, but if the GDP reduces, then it means that the the economy will demand less inputs. 
including from capital and labor. And I'm but the labor with uh, low low uh, low uh, earns. So let me think here. Uh, I have I I I talking about this with my co-workers in the yesterday about the result of employment and mm -hmm. and we have said like the the economy needs the pain for increasing the employment but with low low payments like you need you you increase the low payment to to uh like uh, because to, to do the same you need more labor but not with high salaries like just uh, to... so the the salary now is lower than before yes yes okay okay so uh an interesting presentation um everything here is on the supply side and I think what uh, some of the literature on natural disasters shows is that, um, and you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure how the Brazilian government responded, but uh, you know, usually there's an inflow of uh, funds for rebuilding and uh, you know, disaster aid, so to speak. So, so that sometimes that's international aid in the in a in a context uh, but in a in a large country like brazil there's probably uh, resources flowing through the government to this region so i just wondered if if it would be useful to think about the demand side here as well um uh, and that, uh affects things relative to the the supply side okay thank you Is it a question or a comment? Uh, well, I guess I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. I mean, did the Brazilian government, uh, you know, was there aid coming from the center and, uh, you know, was it large and how, how mm -hmm. might we think about that and, you know, relative to the supply shock? That you're modeling oh, okay i i we don't think about that but it's a good a good point to to see later thank you so much are there other questions all right i think we're we're you know just a little bit ahead of time so we'll just keep moving um Let's see. So uh, the next speaker will be uh, May Wan, uh, who will be speaking about um, climate-driven supply of renewable energy along the electric pathway towards uh, mitigation. Um, I think I saw on the slides that she's doing a case study in New York. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, please, please go ahead, May. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I'm glad you had some preliminary findings that we, we're still in the process of exploring uh, all of the results, which uh, sometimes, in this case, is a little bit challenging. So, uh, and, um, you see, uh, and, uh, I've been collaborating with my colleagues, uh, Karen Papia Aguilera, who's a research expert in or is like Manoy and Sianca is a climate scientist. And we have, we have been attending the Dubai meeting for the past two years, focusing on a meeting up at the framework that is a natural energy economic model with a digital electricity technical model that is and uh, uh, that uh, you with know, uh the human model defined a convergence a convergence solution for the for the uh, power sector and into the carbon markets. And we use that couple couple of model for uh, the past two years on policy analysis. And this year we shift our focus away from policy to the impact of technology and resources. Um, so uh, as the uh, as you were mentioning the Paris Agreement to be on the course achieving net zero emissions economy wide by mid-century, 
and mitigation factors cause for energy system transition that involve rapid expansion of renewable power and uh, economy wide electrification. In this study, we use our integrated framework that is a 12 region model sector, including a generally integrated model called USF, with an electricity sector model called EDIMOD. And EDIMOD explicitly takes into account our demand and our supply of wind and solar by geographic region. So it provides a fine spatial and temporal representation of the power system. The integrated model. Uh, uh, characterizes a complete energy and economic system where all production sectors, farmers, consumers, and government interact to take into account impact. And you know, based on this framework, it augmented those factors that impact the supply of power and demand for power. Um, it, the impact on the supply side comes from the climate projections that provide the estimates on wind power and solar radiation at high temporal resolution. These, ten, these projections may alter the availability of wind and solar energy resources over space and time. We need economy wide decarbonization targets, electricity demand, in order to the massive structural change due to the large scale deployment of electrification technologies. An impact on the demand side is then driven by the level of electrification that informs the variation by hour across seasons over the course of the year. Um, and it power system that balances the grid given the interaction between uncertainty associated with the climate side as well as the variability associated with the electricity electrification deployment on the demand side becomes our focal point. And to help this the analysis Scenarios to adopt a different set of assumptions. Uh, these assumptions include the like, first one uh, whether uh, the whether the scenario uh, has a national climate goal uh, put in place to achieve a 50% reduction by 2030, even to a 90% reduction by 2050. And, and we use 90% because the CG uh, the, the model. We, in the CG model, we don't have the uh, all of this negative emission technology available. So, so we leave some room for those negative uh, technology to to reach that net zero uh, emission targets by the next century. And the second assumption um, is for the wind and solar resource availability. And we took it, we took them from the climate projection generated. From the coupled water emission comparison project, the CIMIT 6, to support the IPCC intergovernmental panel on climate change. And the scenario matrix on the lower left provides sets of coordinated sh uh, shared socioeconomic pathways and representative concentration pathways in from SSP RCT. And it would pick the SSP RCT. Uh, SSP1, RCT8.5, and SSP5, uh, well, SSP and RCT8.5, and, and SSP1, RCT2.6, to represent a shift in the climate condition. And that also uh, is the corresponding wind and solar resource availability. And uh, our current study about next plan is to do a first system model 1.2. That provides the estimates of weekly and solar radiation at temporal resolution as high as the three hour interval. And the third assumption is the level of electrification deployment. We engage uh, the reference and high electrification scenarios from Emerald and Electrification Futures Study in 2019. And the figure on the lower right. Uh, Shows the results from their study and that compares electricity consumptions in the two scenarios. In the reference uh, electrification scenario, electricity consumption increases by 29% from 2018 to 2050, mostly to population and economic growth. Compared to the reference assumption, widespread deployment of electric vehicles, uh, cars, and other electric. Technologies that could increase the US electricity consumption by 40% uh, in 2015. And that is about 80% increase relative to 2018. 
But do you think this is harmful, for example, in highly electrified uh, transportation sector, which alone accounts for 80% of the increase in electricity use in 2050? And these scenarios, uh, one, two, three, four, allow us to explore uh, if we compare scenario one and two, that would allow us to, to, uh, to explore the impact of achieving um, the mitigation targets. Um, and also, if we compare scenario two and three, and that would tell us you know, the impact of evolving demand into the trend of increased electric pollution. And then the last two, three, and four, We've only changed the uh, the solar resources and there would be a shift of climate condition. That will tell us the uh, uh, the climate impact on the ad adaptation of electric power sector to the increasing renewable generation and future electric pollution deployment. So we, we set up set up these uh, scenarios and and name them in a way that since beyond the uh, uh, reference scenario, all scenarios aim to achieve a mitigation target. So they are labeled with the first part denoting the level of electrification deployment, either the reference electrification or a high electrification uh, scenario assumptions. Or, and, and then the second part is the climate projection, either is under the uh, RCP uh, 8.5 or RCP and then we limit our study uh, study scope to rework and may extend to other regions for more for the analysis in the future. Um, so let me start off with a, a brief summary of the changes we needed to bring the uh, mitigation targets. In 2015, the combined wind and solar is brought to capacity in 2015 it was quite equal. And then uh, the, the power system problem is almost too big. Um, and also to meet those targets, from 2020 to 2050, home hydro storage capacity increases by five times, uh, mainly to facilitate the expansion of intermittent uh, generation like the wind and solar, while it also, and at the same time, the electricity consumption increases by 80%, which is uh, similar to the NREL's uh, electrification future study. And now, uh, let's take a look at and then, because that would help us understand the driving force behind the results. And taking the electrification scenarios first. Since our macro model determines the electricity demand, we already apply the hourly load profile to live from NLS and electrification future study scenarios to update our load used in our electricity model. And each profile adds up to one over 8760 hours in one year. The log profile shown uh, in the figure on the left sums over the disaggregated sector profile on the right. And here are some major observations. So the log profile from the reference electrification scenario is assumed to remain in smaller stands throughout the life. And, and also the lim there is a limited electrification assumed for industrial sector um, and considering the technical and economic challenges. And also, uh, uh, we we've learned that you know, uh, there is a there is an assumption of a brief uh, increase in the transportation sector using electricity. But uh, however, we don't find that the uh, 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 the growth in the electric in the transportation electrification would change the charging profile. So there is another change for the transportation sector as well as the uh, industrial sector. And compared to the industrial transportation sectors that show little variation in profile by the century, the high electrification scenario uh, sees a greater variation in the low profile from the residential and commercial sectors, given by the assumption that there is an accelerated adoption of electric equipment for uh, space fuel and, and, and water heating. This leads to an increase in the relative share of any load for winter time. If a cold weather area like in the northeastern region, the, uh, like in New England, New York, Pennsylvania, the increase can be large enough to outpick the summer load. And this can impact uh, power system in terms of how they can cost effectively managing those peaks to avoid breaking systems. And putting these sexual demand 
uh, and the profiles together, the total load profile for in Europe is given a similar seasonal variation as those where the, uh, the uh, residential and commercial sectors. The comparison suggests that the seasonal results actually reveal more interesting findings than any of this. And now we move on to the, uh, the model results. Um, and we find an annual scale where there is one, there's a lot of changes when the change in the the law. So if we drill down to the, uh, to the finer temporal scale, we find seasonal variations, uh, those are obvious and, and, and consistent with those identified in the uh, input net profiles. So when we review the results, we focus on the impact on the uh, electricity prices because it reflects the tension between the power supply and low demand, which subject to change. And to get a sense of the price impact, we come in the middle of the years with the electricity price that falls in the bucket of the price ratio of the price electrification scenario to the daily average of the reference uh, electrification scenario. Take the gen take generator for example uh, as we model in a three hour interval there are eight hourly prices each day on 31 days because 248 counts in January. And out of these 248 counts, 20% of the low, the uh, daily average prices in, in the scenario was reference electrification deployment. And about 70% in, in lightning uh, of those hours are uh, between one to two times uh, the daily average price in the, uh, in the reference. Uh, compared to the reference uh, electric patient deployment. And the rest 10% of that hours represents the high price levels uh, with four hourly prices in the Navy, the Navy color package that stretch above five times the daily average price in the, uh, in the reference electrification scenario. That's almost about uh, beyond $1,000 per hour. And uh, comparing across the seasons in the year, there are relatively more price increases in the winter and more uh, price reductions in the summer. And they're quite consistent with the uh, variation exhibited in the, uh, in the low profiles we did in the last slide, uh, where, where we see the relevant more loads shifted from summer to winter. So, uh, the next slide, we might only introduce a change in the climate projection to the scenario of high electrification. Uh, the figures on the left side show uh, uh, shows the, the profiles of the wind and solar capacity converted from the wind speed and wind solar deviation projected by the, the climate model. Moving from uh, the red line uh, represented by the, uh, representing the RCP to point six, uh, uh, moving from the blue line representing the RCP eight point five to red line RCP two point six. There are ups and downs, with a general pattern remaining as the wind capacity being more abundant in the winter and the solar capacity more abundant in the summer. Specifically, that when we compare the RCP 2.6 to the RCP 8.5, the wind uh, picks up in January and drops in November. From May to um, September, the dip moves a couple months earlier with a drop in May and June and moderate increase in September. And uh, solar drops in uh, March and April. From May, uh, from May to September, the peak of solar um, shifts and comes a couple of months earlier in a similar mood as the, the wind capacity, and leading to an increase in May and June and a drop in July. To September. Um, these changes uh, to the profile that we expect more wind and solar resources available in January, less in March, April, July, and especially um, uh, the big drop uh, in September. The, the result of the electricity price changes seems also consistent with the, these variations in wind and solar resource profile. And comparing to the high electrification scenarios of uh, the climate projection of RCP 8.5, changing the climate projection to RCP 8.6 results in less number of price increases in, in generally in the winter time and more in the, uh, in, 
in the spring and fall, like in, in April and in September. Oh, and then you can see that there's a sliver of the inlet above 10 ton high prices in July. In general, more, uh, so it, but it is like, in, in, in generally that you know, moderate price index becomes more frequent in the spring and fall. So uh, uh, here's a summary, because I want to uh, keep it brief uh, as we're still in the middle of exploring all the results and then understand you know, some of the hourly changes. And so I want to, I just want to stop here with a summary of our preliminary finding that the uh, checking at annual variability given the application and climate impact, which uh, comparing across this scenario, the annual variability is not obvious. And, then, and that the key changes or the major changes lies in occur within the year. Across season and month and maybe and, and we get to uh, uh, check on the days and, and then we probably there are more interesting results uh, lying in there. And then uh, the impact we take the impact on the electricity prices uh, so far and compare across the uh, scenarios as a tension between the supply side and demand side. And, and these results are actually um, very consistent with whatever our, our low profile inputs were, the, uh, the resource profile inputs. So this is how far that we have to go through and we, we're here to uh, put our hats together and to find more interesting stuff and, and share it with you all. You know, range of different things. Um, uh, so, so that's that, that so far I have to Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, May. Um, so we have time for questions. I don't know if anyone has questions. I, I, I guess I have a question. Maybe I'll start, and I guess Juventus is going to chime in in a bit. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure. I, I mean, I understand the point that um, uh, if we electrify things more, uh, you know, we're going to need more supply, and, and the the grid will be stretched, I guess, is uh, if I understood it correctly. Um, and so there, there's price volatility. What is What are you assuming and are there different assumptions that are reasonable about investments in grid capacity to uh, kind of make these transitions easier or, you know, to match supply and demand better, these sorts of things? Yes, it's, uh, it's still all of these whatever the limitation or maybe the feature of the model or something that you know uh, of the power sector how we characterize the or parameterize the storage capacity that would provide some flexibility and moving from hour to hour uh, and how much you know cost assumption that we're putting for the future renewables and greens and uh, and and also um, and also the you know how how fast those those demand uh, on the demand side and the hourly load to change the shape. So all of these are in fact the results. And uh, the investment in those uh, those things that would provide more efficiency of generation or or consumption or uh, or even uh, providing flexibility of moving. Or, um, cutting cutting loads or or uh, a, the better way of managing the, uh, the, uh, the the discrepancy between the load and and the generation supply or cost of the generation supply. So that's that's where you know some that's that's the future direction that we we want to move into. Uh, and as we are still including the model representation of this technology. Okay, thank you. I should, I think Juventus has a question. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Russell. Uh, thank you, May, for the presentation. I just have uh, one clarification. Maybe I miss it in your presentation. So, what kind of climate impact you're talking about, and how does this climate impact can be channeled into the price of the electricity? Payments. Thanks. Sorry, if you're picking up on my end, um, what was your question again? Uh, 
I'm sorry if I miss it in your presentation, but I'm not sure about what type of climate impact that you're talking about and how this climate impact will have impact on the price of electricity. Uh, okay. The climate impact is very in, in captured um, um, yes, on the resource of the resource of the energy that it is, uh, is how much wind solar uh, employees can gather you know, from the turbine, from the panel that, uh, and then operate as a generation in the future grid. So that's, that's where we're trying to introduce. The atomic impact into, into into how the power uh, how the power system can plan for the future and whether there is more solar to be uh, harvest harvested or you know more wind that we can engage or in some in some region and so so there's still a vast amount of uh, literature on that end um, they're trying to get in. Uh, 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 with this target of how much renewables to develop for this region and whether that makes sense given that you know if there is a variability of the future resources that the wind and solar resources that you can get from this region. So but from our study so far that would only take the uh, the climate change the climate change the climate condition from one uh one climate uh, earth system model that provides the highest temporal resolution at three hours in the world. And in the future, we want to expand our um, drawing from uh, a whole slew of maybe more, more of the, uh, the climate models. And, and I understand that from my uh, uh, climate scientists, they call it that uh, they're, for that CIMIC 6 um, study group, there are, there are 30 to 40 models are available at different uh, resolution control spatial resolutions, and we may be able to uh, gather some more information from there. So that's that, that's the interesting point that there is, there is availability, and I'm only catching on capturing what uh, from one of the models. Thanks. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there other questions? Okay, I think that might be it for this paper. Um, so I think, uh, thank, thank you, May Wan, for uh, a nice presentation. Um, and very interesting to see these these models uh, sort of together. It looks like um, so. Um, the 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 next presentation uh, we'll just move on. Uh, the next presentation is uh, developing renewable electricity with carbon tax recycling mechanisms in the East Asia region, and uh, this presentation is by Juventus Offendi. So go ahead, Juventus. Yeah, thank, thanks, Russell. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay, great. Uh, thank you all. Uh, today, I would like to present uh, one chapter of my thesis. I'm a PhD student at Australian National University. And today, I will present the socioeconomic impact of uh, developing renewable electricity with a carbon tax recycling mechanism. So, why is Asia region? First one is that East Asia becoming more important in terms of economy and population. So in 2018, East Asia GDP contributed like around 30% of global GDP. And also the population, the working age population in East Asia region, almost half of global uh, working age population. But despite this uh, rapid development in the economy, there's also rapid increase in carbon emission, like the carbon emission in 1990 and 2018 increased 
by almost uh, two times. And most of these carbon emissions came from came from uh, electricity that produced from fossil fuel. And so the question is how this region can produce uh, enough electricity so they can enhance the economy with lower uh, carbon emission. So there are uh, obstacles in uh, renewable electricity development in East Asia region. The first one is that there is a fluctuate investment in renewable electricity, and also there is a relatively cheaper fossil fuel price and also subsidize on grid electricity tariff. So this lead to less incentive for the producer to develop more uh, renewable electricity. So how to overcome uh, these obstacles? Well, a carbon tax would be a solution because carbon tax will increase the fossil fuel price. It means that it will reduce the demand on fossil fuel and also reduce uh, carbon emission. Also, carbon tax means that there is additional revenue for the government that can be recycled back into the economy. Recycle means that government inject the revenue back to the economy. But up until now, there's a limited study on developing renewable energy or electricity using a recycling carbon mechanism. And also, uh, there's unclear impact on the household expenditure, whether this policy will be uh, progressive or regressive. Progressive means it will be uh, beneficial for the poor household or it will be beneficial for the rich household. So the objective of this study is that this study want to analyze the implication of developing more renewable electricity using carbon tax recycling mechanism by Two simulation. The first one is that there's a reduction in indirect tax for renewable electricity sector. And the second one is uh, government gave subsidy for the household to consume uh, more renewable electricity. So we observe three main indicators. The first one is that the sectoral price and output changes. The second one is the changes in carbon emission and GDP. And the last one is the change in household expenditure and also the poverty incidence. So the contribution of this study is that this is one of the few that study about how we, the government can use carbon tax to develop more renewable electricity. And also we develop a flexible electricity uh, function, means that this model allow uh, there's a substitution between uh, fossil fuel and renewable electricity, and this study covers the East Asia region. And what I mean by East Asia in this study is that cover China, India, uh, Australia, North Korea, Japan, and also ASEAN countries. And how this study will uh, do the analysis is that we develop the interregional CGE and it based on interregional CGE for Indonesia and ASEAN and this is a static uh, multi-country CGE modeling and we have like 33 sector with a disaggregated electricity sector so we have coal oil gas which is fossil fuel electricity and wind hydro solar this is a renewable electricity, and also we have transmission and distribution sector. So the analysis is short term because we assume that laborers are mobile, means that they can move into other sectors, but capital or non labor is uh, immobile. And also we have uh, analysis on carbon emission and household income, which is uh, kept separate from the main model. So we use, uh, but these two analyses use the results from the interregional CG directly. And this is how we uh, construct the production structure. So there are four levels of production function. The first one is there's a substitution between uh, electricity, between the renewable electricity 
and uh, fossil fuel electricity. On the second level, there's a substitution between electricity and energy. On the third level, there's a substitution between a composite of electricity and energy with a composite of primary input, like land, capital, uh, labor, or unskilled labor. And on the top level, there's a substitution between a composite of non-energy and non-electricity, like agriculture or farming until a service sector with the composite of electricity, energy, and primary. So with using this uh, production structure, we can simulate what happened if the price of renewable electricity changes and what happened to the whole uh, economy. The second one is that we develop a specific recycling mechanism to develop renewable electricity. So on the first equation here is that total carbon tax revenue that collected by government should be equal to PCG means the government spending, also plus uh, government subsidize the renewable electricity sector, plus government subsidize the household. So the total carbon tax revenue should be uh, distributed either to its one of these or combination of these. And in terms of how we construct the reduction in the indirect, indirect tax rate, so this equation here shows that the TCI here, the total carbon tax revenue that allocated for uh, industry, renewable electricity sector, is divided by the price and the output of uh, renewable electricity sector. So we can have the rate of uh, reduction in the indirect tax rate. So we put this uh, reduction in the indirect tax rate into the market clearing of the output production at top level. So in this equation here, the, the uh, market clearing one, it shows that the reduction in the indirect tax of renewable electricity can affect directly the domestic price of uh, renewable electricity sector. And the last uh, recycling mechanism is that government gives direct subsidy for the household to consume more renewable electricity by give a uh, subsidy rate. So this one is T rent. So we compute similar with the indirect tax rate, reduction in indirect tax rate. So we allocate the TCH here, which is total carbon tax revenue for the household, divided by the price that household pay. And also X house here is the demand from the household for renewable electricity. So X house here, X house S here is the demand. And we can see that the subsidy will affect the commodity price, the price of renewable electricity that paid by the household. By EH here is the disposable income of the household. Well, in terms of data, we use, uh, we construct East Asia Interregional Social Accounting Matrix based on GTEP Power 9 database. The base here is 2011. Also, we uh, extract some micro data set from different household surveys in East Asia region countries. And the last one is the parameter of the models, the elasticity of substitution. We use it from a different uh, study and also from GTAP for the uh, trade elasticity. So there are uh, three simulations in this study. The first one is that uh, government collect this uh, carbon tax revenue and reallocate 100% to increase government spending. The second one is that government uh, use all this carbon tax revenue to give indirect tax reduction for the renewable electricity sector. And the last one is government give all this carbon tax revenue to subsidize the household to consume more renewable electricity. And the results are in real change. So we computed at the original price and also it's relative to the baseline. So this is how the model works. 
So first, for example, the government collect carbon tax means that the price of energy will uh, rise. It means that industry and household energy demand will fall because the price now is relatively more expensive. And also the industry will adjust and, and there is some industrial structure change. It means that uh, the industry will produce less because now it's more expensive to produce the output. And then the factor payment will fall. It means that uh, labor and capital will receive less income. And then the owner of capital and labor, which is household, also will have a reduction in the income. And because uh, there's a reduction in the demand for energy, the carbon emission will fall. And because of this, uh, this is how the model works. So how this carbon tax will affect the economy and also will affect the household. And the last one is it will affect the carbon emission. This is the result. I start with the sectoral changes. So in simulation one, when government uh, put the carbon tax and use it to increase the government spending. So we can see here that there's a reduction in the all sector output. That's mainly because now the price is more expensive to produce output and producer will produce less. But in simulation two, when government gives subsidy for uh, renewable electricity sector, the output of renewable electricity sector will increase this uh, green box. And also we observe there are some spillover effects to other sectors. For example, like in Japan and India, the increase in uh, manufacturing sector output. That's mainly because when renewable electricity sector expands, it will demand more input from other sectors. So the other sector will respond by they will increase their output to fulfill this increasing in demand. And the last one in simulation three is that uh, government give subsidy for the household to consume more renewable electricity, means the price is now lower for the household to uh, consume renewable electricity, means the renewable electricity sector will respond by producing more output. And also we can see that there are some spillover, especially in China for manufacturing sector, and also for Australia. And the sector output can be aggregated into the GDP. The, so this uh, result here shows that when government uh, have a carbon tax, it will reduce the GDP because the sectoral output uh, shrink. And also because there are now less output produced, there will be a reduction in the carbon uh, dioxide emission. In simulation two, we can see here that IDN, Indonesia will have a double dividend, means that the economy will expand while the carbon emission reduce but other countries only have uh, environmental benefit only, means that there's only reduction in carbon emission, but the economy is still uh, same. And the last one is when government gives some subsidy for the household, you can see that there are three group of country. There are rebound effect in Australia, India, Indonesia, and rest of ASEAN, but there's only Environmental, environmental benefit only for China, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. But we also find there's a double dividend in India. And that changes in the sectoral and GDP will lead to change in household income. And change in household income will lead to change in household expenditure. So in this study, we disaggregate the household into 100 different types of household in urban and rural. Why we do that? Because we want to see whether this policy has a progressive or regressive pattern. 
So in simulation one here on the left hand side here, we can see that in Indonesia there is a progressive pattern, means that carbon tax affect more on the richer household, mainly because the rich household uh, consume more fossil fuel food products. But in China, there's a regressive pattern, means that the poor more effective, affected. And the last one is Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam has a relatively flat distribution, means that the budget share on renewable probably similar and the factor income distribution also similar. In simulation three, when government gives some subsidy for the household, we can see that the pattern changed significantly. For example, in Indonesia, from progressive pattern into regressive, in China from regressive into progressive, but in Vietnam, we still observe like a natural uh, distributive impact, or it's still flat. So changes in this uh, household expenditure will have impact on changes in the poverty. So in simulation one, poverty incident rise mainly because the price of commodity now become more expensive and also other commodities price will rise. It means that the household will reduce their consumption because now they have to pay more for the same uh, demand on commodities. In simulation two, Indonesia and rest of ASEAN have experience in poverty, uh, reduction in poverty incidence, mainly because the government increased the transfer and the government can transfer more to the household because there's an increase in indirect tax and import tax revenue. In simulation three, there are three groups of country decreasing urban and rural poverty incidence in China, India, Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam. And there's an increase in urban and rural poverty incident in Indonesia and rest of ASEAN. But in Thailand, there's only increasing in the rural poverty incident. So this is mainly because of the changes in the household income and also change in the commodity price in each country. So we also did sensitivity analysis because we uh, use uh, elasticity of substitution from other studies. So we did some uh, analysis on uh, substitution between electricity input and substitution between energy and electricity input and also carbon tax value. So we changed the parameter plus minus 10% from our baseline. And also we run each simulation for 100 times. And also at the end, we compute the mean and standard deviation. So we can conclude that the many results are relatively robust because the sign are consistent with the many result and also has a lower standard deviation value. So for conclusion is that what is the best policy for each East Asian countries to develop their renewable electricity? In simulation one, it's clearly that carbon tax only lead to uh, carbon emission reduction only. In simulation two, Indonesia will have benefit in terms of economy. And also all East Asian countries will have reduction in carbon emission, but poverty incidents will fall only in Indonesia and rest of ASEAN. In simulation three, India economy will expand, but not all countries can have a reduction in carbon emission. And also poverty incident will fall in uh, China, India, Malaysia, Philippines, and uh, Vietnam. And with that, I conclude my presentation and thank you. Thank you, Yuvent. Very interesting presentation. Uh, are there questions? Can I, can I ask some questions? Yes, I sure. Mean, uh, I was wondering whether in the estimates you you have into account that depending on the sector, the demand for carbon or all these inputs change. I mean, or, or are you assuming that all sectors demand exactly the same amount of these energies? That is one of the questions that I had. Sorry, uh, I can't catch it clearly. So, uh, but you I'm saying is whether, I mean, whether 
are you guys assuming that all sectors use exactly or have exactly the same demand of these like carbon or these like non-renewable energies to make all, all this? Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the question, Manuel. That's an interesting question. So we cannot assume that all sectors have a similar demand on renewable electricity sector because we know that different sector will demand different uh, kind of input. For example, like manufacturing sector will demand more uh, energy and electricity input, but agriculture probably will demand less. And also service sector, we have like uh, government spending or transportation will also demand a different kind of uh, fossil fuel products. And so, in this model, now uh, each sector will have a different demand on different input. So we don't oh, assume. Oh, that okay. Okay. I I I I did not get that interpretation. Good. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, do you get, uh, do you know exactly how much the government will be collecting and will be like relocating in the market? Because what I yeah. get is that there is like a tax collection that is going to be redistributed and that is shifting the demand in the the, sir, in the in the simulation tree that is moving a lot. So I was wondering if you guys have a sense of that magnitude that that should be huge. Yeah. Uh... Thank you. I forgot to mention in my presentation. So we assume that in this study, the government collects only one US dollar per ton of carbon emission. So it is relatively low compared to European countries. They collect like 30 US dollar per ton of carbon emission. But we think that this one dollar per ton of carbon emission is reasonable because we want this all countries in this region agree to implement carbon tax. So with this uh, relatively low carbon tax value, the revenue that government collect is relatively small. So I put it in the paper, but I forgot the exact number. It's like less than 0.01% of GDP. So it's relatively small. So that's why if you see the results here, this is in percent change. And we can see that, for example, the change in sectoral output is less than like 1%. That's mainly because the carbon tax value is relatively low. But if we increase the carbon tax value, probably the change will be will be more uh, significant in terms of percentage. Yeah, thank you. I forgot to mention that. No worries. Thank you so much. So I guess I have a question. One of the things, when you model internationally this uh, these issues, is um, I mean you're imposing the same policy on all the countries. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you have ways of thinking about how different countries might want to do things differently because of? Uh, you know, the availability of wind power or solar or, or the importance of fossil fuels in the economy as it is, like, are there countries that would be opposed to this, more opposed or more in favor? Well, uh, thanks, Hassan. That's an interesting question. Yes, uh, each country has different endowment on uh, fossil fuels and also renewables, but in this uh, study, we impose this carbon tax revenue, and we also impose that government use all this carbon tax revenue. It means that there's a neutrality in uh, carbon tax policy. It means that government will not spend less, but they will uh, receive a several amount of carbon tax and they can use it directly into the economy. And yeah, uh, different endowment in the economy. I think it will be captured in this uh, industry structure for each country. So 
even though we have a uniform policy for each country, what happened here in number four here, change in the industry structure will be different for each country. That's why we can see the results is different for each country in each simulation. For example, in simulation two, when government gives some subsidy for the renewable electricity sector, not all countries, the manufacturing sector in all countries in this, but only in Japan, India, South Korea, and also in Vietnam. But other, other countries, they will have reduction in the manufacturing sector. Right? And also in here, for example, in South Korea, in simulation two, the fossil fuel electricity increase, but others, other countries have reduction in fossil fuel electricity. Why? Because mainly in South Korea, when renewable electricity increase, they will demand more input, and manufacturing sector will uh, produce more, but manufacturing sector also demand input from electricity, both from fossil fuel and renewable. So we have like this uh, full cycle in the economy. But yeah, I think you're right. Uh, different country will have different endowment on fossil fuel and renewable, and we capture that in uh, modern Yeah, and I guess, um... Uh, I'm sure it was there, but uh, can we see how the emissions change across oh, yeah. the country? Yeah, we have here in. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I see on that pipe. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Are there other? Oh, question. Uh, interesting. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, I think your voice is not clear. Uh, okay, so I just wonder if you have any questions of these policies. Uh, hello? Hello? Yeah, uh, sorry, I think I'm missing. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, my problem is with the condition. What are you doing with the cost effect of the policy? So, whether the policy is going to change, and you can set aside some efficient way of doing it. Oh, sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch. Your question. Uh, maybe Russell can hear. Me. I, I couldn't get it either. I think the, the connection is just quite poor, so I, I didn't quite get the question. Is it getting better? Oh, that's a little uh, better, yes. Okay, so I moved around. Um, I wonder if the way you the cost effect. I can get but the is cost. It, she's, she's asking about the effectiveness of the policy. Effectiveness. Well, I think I summarized at the end of the presentation. So each country did have a different uh, structure. So it will depends on the government whether they want to do uh, like, for example, give subsidy to the industry or to give subsidy to the household. For example, if I'm an Indonesian government, I will be interested in simulation two because it will expand my economy, but also will reduce my uh, carbon emission. And also it will reduce uh, poverty incidence in the country. So I think, yeah, the effectiveness, it will depends on how its government see whether this uh, policy being involved on uh, I think that's uh, answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, thank you. Okay, I think it for questions. Um, uh, so I think it's been a very interesting session. Uh, we've had a lot of 
uh, work on energy from different points of view, energy and mining, uh, and this earlier paper on trade markups. Uh, so I think, you know, congratulations to everyone for doing such good work. And, um, you know, I, I'm really great that we can have this session today. So thank you very much.